Terrible droughts driven by climate change can increase greenhouse gas emissions in a way you wouldn't expect. When the reservoirs at electric power dams run low, utilities make up the difference by burning more fossil fuels. In a new case study of the American West, the extra emissions are significant. This is just one part of the big story emerging as the world warms. Our guest is a drought specialist from Stanford University's Department of Earth System Science. Julio Herrera Estrada is a postdoctoral scholar with published research on droughts in Mexico, the United States, and Africa. Julio, welcome to Radio EcoShock. Thank you very much, Alex. Thanks for having me. Let's talk about your recent paper, Response of Electricity Sector Air Pollution Emissions to Drought Conditions in the Western United States. That was published December 21st, 2018 in Environmental Research Letters. First of all, how do CO2 emissions from the electricity sector figure in the overall total of U.S. greenhouse gas emissions, say compared to cars or all the other uses we have? In the U.S., uh, the power sector produces around a third of uh, the total emissions from all the sectors. Globally, this number is, I think, closer to a quarter, so 25% of all emissions as best as we understand it, tend to come from the power sector. So it really matters what happens in that sector. And Julio, what happens when giant power dams lose water capacity during a drought? So we find that when we have less uh, capacity of hydropower, for example, and even other power plants as well, like natural gas and nuclear, because of a drought, you see an increase in generation with uh, natural gas and, and coal. And the point is that in the U.S. especially, you know, People want to make sure that when they turn on the switch, like the light will turn on, right? And so in order to have that level of reliability, there needs to be a lot of backup generation. And here, the backup generation is coal and natural gas, depending on the state. So again, when, when hydropower runs dry uh, or nuclear power decreases or other type of uh, electricity generation is affected by a drought, natural gas or coal power plants will come online to make sure that electricity keeps flowing into people's homes uh, and, you know, help produce products and industry and whatnot. So that will lead to an increase in gener- in CO2 emissions from the power sector. And let's say we have a big drought in the western United States. How much of a difference would it make that they had to kick in the natural gas generators or turn on the coal? In our study, we studied the data record that we have from 2001 to 2015. So the advantage of that is that we draw our conclusions directly from observations. The drawback is that if there was not a big drought uh, in a given year, uh, in in this time period, in a given state, uh, we might not be able to measure the response of the electricity sector in that state. So in this time period, 2001 to to 2015, we especially saw important droughts occurring in in the west coast of the U.S., California, Washington, Oregon. And for those states specifically, we see an increase of about 10% in the emissions during drought years. So it's not just hydroelectric power plants that are affected, as you've said in your papers. I mean, fossil fuel plants need water for cooling, and even nuclear power plants need water for cooling. And if that water isn't available or it's too hot, they've got to shut down. So drought can affect that second stage of power production as well. That's correct. And what do your studies and the IPCC say about the evolution of drought for the coming decades as the Earth warms? What are the overall predictions? Yes, it's, it's uh, a good question. Again, it depends on the region. Uh, for the western U.S., we tend to be experiencing drying, at least from the, the, soil, perspective, the soil moisture perspective. So, so that's particularly important for agriculture and for vegetation. From the electricity generation side of things, the the question is a bit trickier uh, on one hand because not all the models have consistent projections in terms of what's going to happen to rainfall and to runoff, which is the the important variable to look at for um, recharge of rivers, which again are important for for electricity generation. Having said that, uh, with a warmer world, we're going to see decreasing snowpack, having more precipitation come down as rain instead of snow. And so that is going to affect, at least in the western U.S., um, the, ability, the, the generation during the spring and summer season um, since there's going to be less uh, snow melt happening throughout the spring and, uh, and into the summer that will help continue replenish the, the reservoirs. Uh, 
we might start seeing more uh, rapid, you know, sort of rainfall events, uh, again, because of this uh, effect that you mentioned of the atmosphere being able to hold more capacity, and as well as the effect of uh, temperature that makes it fall as rainfall instead of snowfall. Um, so, so electricity in the future might have a, uh, in the Western U.S., have it um, less reliable supply from hydro in the spring and summer months in the future. And it seems like there's been a lot of severe droughts in the U.S. in the last 10 years. We had the 2011 drought in Texas, one in the U.S. Central Great Plains in 2012, and that five-year monster in California from 2012 to 2017. Is that normal, Julio, historically, say, or are we already experiencing the impact of climate change? That's a good question. Uh, We are definitely already experiencing the impact. Uh, I mean, on one hand, drought is, is normal. Uh, every we normally especially define drought as uh, below normal water availability, and so that means because of that definition, that's a relative to the normal. That a drought can happen everywhere, um, in, even in semi-arid regions. But what we're seeing, especially in the in the U.S. and the Western U.S., is more prolonged droughts. And uh, I'm not a particular expert in this subject, but there is also an understanding that this is part of a bigger mega drought of the Western U.S. We've basically had a, a drought in the Western U.S. for the last few decades, or a decade more or less. And so that's, again, not out of the long-term record, completely out of the ordinary, but it is more likely that we're having these type of large and long-lasting droughts because of climate change. Again, in large part because of this warming trend that increases evapotranspiration and offsets changes in, in rainfall that, that may be helping alleviate some of the drought. The news is full of mixed messages about drought in Africa. The Sahel is drying up, one says, while another talks about the future greening of Sahara. So I'm a little mixed up about it. Julio, you have studied African droughts. Is there a big picture developing there? Yes, one of the the, the things that makes uh, it complicated to study drought in, in Africa and in other developing regions is the decreasing number of observations from the ground. We have fewer and fewer stations, hydrometeorological stations on the ground reporting and relatively short records. So uh, in terms of identifying trends, that makes it hard. And part of the reason for why we're starting to see in some ways a greening of the area is because there was a big drought in the Sahel in the, the second half of the 20th century. And with satellite records, which kicked in around the end of the 1970s, beginning of the 1980s, we are looking at the recovery of the Sahel from those time periods, but it's a recovery from a, a long-lasting drought, if that makes sense. So it's not clear if that increasing trend is uh, really more of a recovery or an actual increase, like long-term increasing trend. My understanding is that the, that region gets a lot of its water from the West African monsoon. And so there have been some studies that project a, a narrowing of the West African monsoon in terms of the, the time that it spans. If there's a delay in the onset or uh, shorting in the Uh, end of the monsoon, that is going to have important implications for drought development in the region. Radio Ecoshock. We're talking with Dr. Julio Herrera Estrada from Stanford. He uh, researches the nature of droughts and their impacts on power generation and greenhouse gas emissions. This is Radio Ecoshock. I'm Alex Smith. In the plain language summary for your July 2017 paper, we find, quote, After droughts have grown and become intense enough, they will tend to become even larger and more intense before conditions improve. Julio, please talk to us about that. Yes, that was an interesting behavior that we found of the droughts that we were studying, and and we found this relationship to be true globally. Basically, we were looking at droughts that were the order of a few hundred thousand square kilometers, and we found that when droughts become that large, the propensities for those routes to continue growing further. Uh, in the observations, again, we, we, this is a data-driven study in where we, we identify the droughts and then we see how the drought behaves after that. So we measured uh, the probabilities of the, grou- of the droughts you know, growing or shrinking, and ultimately we found that after the drought has reached those type of thresholds area-wise and intensity-wise, or like the probability of the, of the drought growing is higher than of the drought shrinking. So the drought will continue growing until it's, it reaches, again, a, a turning point, and then it'll start alleviating. So it can get worse before it gets better when you have a big one. 
Yes, exactly. And, and you know, the, we still are in the process of studying why that might be. One of the hypotheses is that there are sort of positive feedbacks, vicious cycles that, you know, when it's dry, uh, there's less evaporation. And because there's less evaporation, there's less water in the atmosphere, the water vapor in the atmosphere, and therefore there's a lower chance of rain. So you have, um, because there's then a lower chance of rain, that there's a drier soil. And again, this, that's a vicious cycle in a way. So we are potentially thinking of an example of a mechanism for, for why we might see this uh, event where the droughts become larger and larger and, and more intense before they start to recover. There's some real worry out there about super droughts uh, coming even from some of the best climate scientists. I mean, Dr. Jonathan Overpeck back in 2005 raised the question of whether we were at the dawn of a super interglacial drought, as he called it. And then we had that February 2015 issue of Science Advances with Benjamin Cook and his co-authors. Uh, the title of the paper was Unprecedented 21st Century Drought Risk in the American Southwest and Central Plains. They suggest mega droughts worse than even happened in medieval times. What are your thoughts about all that? Yeah, well, I mean, these are great researchers, and, and so they've asked really interesting questions. And the, the really interesting thing about the research is that they put their the current droughts in the perspective of the paleo record, uh, looking at you know hundreds, thousands of years, how normal or how, what's the probability of having droughts like the ones that we see today. So in terms of the the science aspect of it, I think it's gonna it's it's still an active area of research, understanding what are the drivers of these mega droughts, uh, understanding what caused them in the past, and if those mechanisms are becoming stronger in a definite way in the current climate. But from the other side, from the what do we do about it, I think it's also important to not get crippled by the you know potential uncertainty that we have in some of these projections. I recently interviewed Dr. Victor, and uh, it was a recent comment in the journal Nature by Shu Ramanathan and Victor talking about three reasons global warming will be worse than previously thought. And one factor they pinpointed was a natural warming cycle coming out of interdecadal changes in ocean heat, mainly in the Pacific, but also changes in Atlantic mixing. My question for you is, did you see signs that these large ocean cycles are also affecting the droughts you study on land? That's not been a focus of my research. The thing that's important to note, and going back to what I mentioned about having enough observations, is that at least from the data that I've been using, has been mostly, you know, these global data sets that we have, they tend to go back around to 1980s, end of 1979, because that's when the satellite era sort of began. I've been focusing my work on and this last you know, 30, 40 years of data to, to understand these global aspects of, of the drought system uh, from the observational record or as close to the observational record as we can. However, the advantages that, uh, that other paleo researchers have is that they, they identify proxies that can go back hundreds or thousands or millions of years uh, into the past to, to help us understand the, this, the cycles. The ocean is a very interesting system that modulates in, in very long time scales the climate system. So we see this interdecadal shift, you know, again, as, as the name suggests, is, uh, over a period of many decades. And unfortunately, we don't have too many decades uh, of data from satellites to be able to measure this directly. So normally, either people focus on using climate models to run experiments or look at this proxy uh, measurements from from paleoclimate to try to understand that, that span again multiple decades, multiple centuries to understand the effect of this uh, decadal variability from the ocean. Well, here's a rather simple question, but if a part of the world stays in a drought so long that it seems permanent, when does a drought become a desert? And for example, I mean, even the UN has um, the two terms are you know drought and desertification, and as you mentioned, in some cases. A drought might, might really me, uh, show a, a bigger trend underneath it. Like a, a drought is normally defined, as I mentioned, as in some ways like a temporary deviation from what normal conditions are. Uh, as I said, everywhere experiences drier water conditions from time to time, and so the drought is the drier side. However, we start seeing a drying trend over a period of multiple years that just doesn't recover. That's what we start just calling desertification. And while some of the processes that are involved in both of these events, the droughts and the certification might be similar. Uh, overall, they're also very different processes because 
in one case, for example, for a drought, it's, it's um, you know, for example, a high pressure system that's preventing, you know, rainfall from reaching a given area. But if we have the certification, that shows a broader change in the latitude, for example, of pressure systems overall. Uh, it's not just a temporary pressure system that, you know, happened to be parked here, if that makes sense. It's, it's part of a bigger long-term change that may be associated with this intradecadal variability that we see coming from the ocean, for example. And from what you've seen, should we expect drought to significantly affect future food production? I think so. And I think one thing that's also emerging is the study of the impact of droughts in different places uh, at the same time, right? So if we have a drought in, in the U.S., but overall good conditions throughout the world, our global food trade network allows us to mitigate some of that, you know, shock to the food market. But if we start having multiple droughts, simultaneously in different places, that might be important for food supply globally. And, you know, that will be reflected in in prices of of commodities and and food. And going back to what we mentioned at the beginning, with a higher temperature, there's a higher likelihood in general of a dry year becoming a, a drought year from the agricultural side of things. What do you see as the remaining frontiers for scientific exploration of drought? I think one aspect that we mentioned towards the end of one of my papers uh, about how droughts move is precisely that we haven't studied thoroughly the movement or like how droughts behave in space and time simultaneously. We tend to focus on, for example, how a drought in California evolves, but that is a very limited picture. We need to broaden the view and understand how droughts in North America behave to understand how a drought in California might end up in the Midwest, for example. By studying that more, we can un- and the drivers of that, it will hopefully also be able- allow us to predict droughts better in the future. And one thing that I also mentioned should also, should also mention is there is also a lot of work to be done in terms of understanding and characterizing drought risk, security, uh, you know, threats from droughts, uh, because the impact of drought on agriculture is a is an obvious one, but um, the impact of drought on energy or the impact of drought on the wastewater treatment sector, or um, how drought affects water utilities in general from, from a, a financial standpoint. Those are questions that we haven't really asked much to in terms both of the science of drought as well as the impact of drought on the economy. From Stanford University, we've been talking with the rising drought specialist, Dr. Julio Herrera Estrada. Julio is the lead author in the paper Response of Electricity Sector Air Pollution Emissions, to drought conditions in the western United States. You can find links to this and to Julio's website in my weekly show blog at ecoshock.org. Julio, thank you so much for talking with us. Thank you so much for having me, Alex. It was a pleasure. I'm Alex Smith for Radio Ecoshock. You can help educate everyone you know and the world by forwarding links to the Radio Ecoshock shows and interviews. Help me get the voice of scientists out as far as we can. Get it at ecoshock.org. Thank you for listening, and let's do it again next week.